Hello everyone, I'm Michaela Kathleen and I'm here today with my June wrap-up, which I only read two books this month, but that was kind of by design. I wanted to really invest some time in this behemoth and take my time with it. But before reading To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, I read Marvel's Powers of a Girl because I did read the entire Chaos Walking trilogy last month so I wanted something light and easy before jumping into another big read. And this was a perfect little palette cleanser. It's basically just bios of various Marvel female superheroes and it is filled with really gorgeous artwork. The bios are entertaining. I always like learning more about the Marvel Universe. I most especially enjoyed Scarlet Witch's bio. She had some really interesting information in her bio that I didn't know. This is something that I got by cashing in points on my Disney Insiders account. So it's really everything I could have expected from a book like this. I will say sometimes it maybe tries a little too hard to be hip, but overall a fun light read, a good palette cleanser between some very big reads. And then before getting into Sleep in a Sea of Stars, I did also watch the Chaos Walking movie adaptation this month and it was terrible. It was so bad. It was maybe worse than the Aragon adaptation, which is famously a pretty terrible adaptation. Again, I don't understand what these producers are thinking when they're adapting these books because there's just no way that they could continue on with the series from here, even if the movie was successful. Like, they've changed it so completely that they could never do the sequel or the third book. So I don't know what they were thinking. But yeah, it just lost all of the thematic elements of the book, as well as a lot of the plot, and it was terrible. Honestly, my biggest complaint was the fact that Manchi doesn't talk, the dog doesn't talk, which is like what makes him such a beloved character. So that was horrifying. The only kind of redeeming part of the movie was whenever Todd was thinking something embarrassing. Tom Holland is so adorable and so it just came across very adorable and funny. But other than that there was really basically nothing redeeming about this movie adaptation. <laughs> but moving on from that to the main event of this video and that is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini, which I went into this one with some kind of mixed feelings. The Inheritance Cycle by Christopher Paolini is a childhood classic for me, one of my all-time favorites. I just reread it last year and had such a fun time, so I was really excited to read his first ever book that is not The Inheritance Cycle, but it is a sci-fi novel and a space opera, which is not my thing. And as I have mentioned, it is ginormous and I had flicked through and seen some of the kind of technical looking stuff and so it was just very intimidating. So my experiences with the inheritance cycle but also my kind of lukewarm feelings towards sci-fi both probably informed my reading of this book. Spoilers for this entire book and then also some spoilers for the inheritance cycle because I'm gonna be talking about that a lot too. So first I'm going to talk about all of the Inheritance Cycle goodies that I noticed because he did include kind of shout outs to the series for us fans. I'm sure there were some I missed, there's some that I maybe was reading into too much and weren't actually references, but I'm going to talk about the ones that I noticed. So in this book our main character comes in contact with an alien we're not really sure if it's a sentient species, if it's an alien technology, but basically it becomes a suit on her body. And there's this part in the book kind of early on where she's trying to name the suit. This was my favorite part of the book. And she's thinking of names and she thinks of one and the suit kind of sends her some, I don't know, images to make it clear that it already has a name and it's kind of trying to convey what the name is even though they don't really speak the same language. It makes her feel very differently about the suit. Like if she were the one to have named it, it would have, she says that it would have felt like a pet, but because it already had a name and it told her its name, it felt more like an equal. And I really liked that sentiment. 
but the inheritance cycle element of this that I said it made me think of was the naming process of Sephira, both when Aragorn names her in book one, but then also when the two of them go seek out their true names and she figures hers out first in the final book, which also was kind of one of my favorite parts of the inheritance cycle. And again, Aragorn, like, he obviously already respected and loved Sephira before he knew her true name, but that just, like, increased a lot when they discovered her true name together. And so it just kind of reminded me of that part of the inheritance cycle, and I really liked that part. Also, the way that the suit communicates with our main character, Kira, also kind of reminds me of how the spackle communicate in Chaos Walking. At the beginning of part two, we were introduced to the woman, Anari, and her pet cat, Hastandi. No idea if I'm pronouncing those correctly, but doesn't matter because I know they are actually Angela and Solombum, <laughs> which was very exciting. <laughs> they just have a very small little cameo kind of early in the book, but it's really fun. Another kind of not so much inheritance cycle connection as I think just kind of a thing that Christopher is into and puts in his books, and that is he always has really interesting religions in his books. And I always kind of like reading his thoughts on religion and seeing the religions, the made up religions that he comes up with for his books. It kind of plays into his kind of philosophic writing that he sometimes has in parts of his books, which I don't know, for some people maybe sometimes comes across like a little trying too hard or whatever, but I really enjoy Christopher's philosophic thoughts. <laughs> The kind of humanoid nightmare in part three of the book reminds me strongly of the Razak. They have that same kind of hissing way of talking with all of the S's in a row. The ship mines remind me strongly of Eldenari. And I really enjoyed the <laughs> acknowledgements for this book in which Christopher directly talks about some of the inheritance cycle references. Honestly, the acknowledgements were probably like my second favorite part of the book, which is maybe not a good thing, but but going into talking about the, the book on its own, not in reference to the inheritance cycle, it did have kind of a slow start for me. Part one I did not find super interesting, and I just really was not connecting with any of the characters, even the main character, which was worrisome. There was a little shout out to Michael Crichton in part one, which was fun. Always nice to have a uh, shout out to an author in the genre that you're writing in. I did find some of the technology to be interesting, the overlay implants and the way Kira thinks about them and how when she loses them it's like she's really lost a very big part of herself was very interesting, which does make sense because the technology at this point is literally integrated into you. I mean we feel very weird just when we forget our phones at home and so imagining losing something that's actually like an overlay over your eyesight it, it would probably feel like a very big loss so I don't know I found that interesting to think about and then I did finally start connecting with Kira the main character a little bit towards the end of part one when she goes on her first long journey by herself and she starts kind of communicating with the Xeno her her suit the alien suit and of course, like I talked about, when the suit kind of tells her its name, that's kind of when I started connecting with the character a little bit more. And so that did make me a lot more excited for part two, because that's kind of where part one leaves off, and I was starting to finally get interested. <laughs> then part two was kind of slow again. We got introduced to the crew on the Wallfish spaceship, which was fun because having like a ship crew is just a fun trope. But like, this ship crew wasn't my favorite crew of all time, so I think it was more so just the fun trope rather than me actually really liking the characters a whole lot. And then yeah, part two was kind of just about getting to know the crew. So then moving on to part three, they're kind of on their first like mission for the book and a character from part one shows back up, which I got v bad vibes from. I thought she was gonna turn out to have been manipulated by the aliens that they're fighting, but that did not turn out happening. <laughs> and then kind of later in part three, 
we got to know one of the crew members a little better, our main character and the ship captain. Play a card game in which they're kind of betting personal questions, so if one of them loses a round they have to answer a personal question, which is kind of my jam, that kind of a thing. Some people might not like it because it's not moving the plot along really at all, but I'm more of a character reader, I guess. And so, like, characters playing a card game and chit-chatting is, like, totally my jam, but this one just didn't really super work for me. I didn't end up feeling much more invested in either of the characters after they like, you know, spill their deep dark secrets. So yeah, again, a kind of a trope that I like, but not done in the best, most interesting way. Moving on to part four of the book. At this point, I kind of realized how long Trig had just been hanging out in cryo, just being lugged along on all these adventures, totally unconscious, which felt very weird for me. I also started thinking about the ship pig. The ship pig, uh, his life is threatened in this part of the book, but like we only saw him for like a very little amount of time back in part two. So while it's a fun detail to have a pig on a spaceship, again I feel like I just wasn't super invested in this pig and so when its life was threatened by the aliens I didn't care much. And that being like the catalyst for Grigorovich, the ship mine, suddenly not being incapacitated anymore seemed so weird. <laughs> Maybe because I didn't have a whole lot of connection to the pig. This was also the part where, again, a lot of things felt unnecessary. Like the Staff of Blue. They went out to find this Staff of Blue, which was supposed to be this very powerful weapon, but it turns out to be broken and then it never plays a part in the book. Like they don't end up fixing it and using it or anything. So that also felt like a waste of pages. <laughs> so yeah, there was a lot in the book that I was like, hmm, why is this here? Especially because I don't think there's gonna be a direct sequel for this book. I think there are gonna be other books in kind of the same universe but not a direct sequel for this one. And so I feel like everything in this one should have kind of mattered and wrapped up. This book had a very long ending, which is kind of another Christopher thing. The final book in the Inheritance Cycle has a very long ending with kind of people say that it has multiple endings because there are two final battles and then also a really big wrap up after the two final battles and sort of a lot starts happening at once at the end. Kira's suit suddenly can do basically anything. <laughs> Definitely a bit overpowered, which it was all really interesting, like the suit being able to grow its own planet basically and all this stuff, but it was also just like, really? It could do all this this whole time? So yeah, definitely mixed feelings on this book. It was pretty slow, but also like interesting. I think it could have been shorter. <laughs> the entire trip to Bug Hunt to get the Staff of Blue felt pointless. Really fun for if you're a fan of the Inheritance Cycle, fun to see all the Easter eggs. But yeah, kind of mixed feelings. I gave it three stars, but I give this beautiful cover five stars. <laughs> so yeah, that is everything I read for the month of June. Really dedicated the month mainly to Sleep in a Sea of Stars. Let me know down below what you read in June. Have you read this one yet? Are you a fan of the Inheritance Cycle and did you enjoy any Easter eggs or catch any that I missed? Let's talk about this book down below in the comments. I hope you enjoyed watching and now on to the quote for today's video, which today I have one from Wilhelm Steckel and it goes, The mark of the immature man is that he wants to die nobly for a cause, while the mark of a mature man is that he wants to live humbly for one. Thanks for watching. Remember, words matter.